Um, good morning. My name is Amanda Kaiser. Uh, I work at the nonprofit B Lab. Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to our panelists and thank you to all of you for being here um, on a Friday morning at the end of uh, what has been an incredible uh, SOCAP celebrating 10 years. Um, our hope is today uh, that we're going to talk about the tool that uh, B-Lab has created and that we're using with our partners, and that truthfully that this is a conversation. Um, because the, the, at the core of what we do at B-Lab and what our partners do is we really want to make um, our work feel tangible and relevant. And so uh, we're going to share a little bit about uh, the background of the Beanpact Assessment. Um, we're going to uh, hear from these incredible women about the work that they're doing um, in their organizations. And then I'd love to hear from some of you all about your questions. We'll spend some time talking through those um, and give you a sense. And, and hopefully at the end of our hour together, you'll feel better informed to make good decisions to think about how this work might apply to what you're doing. Um, so before I get an opportunity to introduce both of you, I'd, I'd love to actually see from folks who are in the room, how many of you are um, entrepreneurs or business leaders? By show of hands, great. Um, investors? A handful, great. Um, accelerator programs, nonprofits, community-based organizations? Great. Um, anybody else? Some lawyers or uh, awesome? <laughs> um, Anybody else I'm missing? You can shout it out. Evaluator. Evaluator, great, awesome. Good. Well, before we get into kind of the background of the B Impact Assessment, tell you a little bit about the tool and what it what it does, I'd love to turn it over to the two of you um, to tell us a bit about your work, um, introduce yourself and your organizations, and kind of how you are using the tools today. Great. Um, thank you guys for coming here on a Friday morning, and congratulations on making it to your last session. <laughs> so uh, my name is Judy Park. I'm from Being Capital Double Impact. Um, it's a new impact investment firm um, within Being Capital. Um, and the mission of our fund, I don't know if some of you guys were there um, at the session um, yesterday when one of my colleagues was speaking, but it's sort of to prove that um, even at scale private equity investing, there does not have to be a trade-off between financial returns and the social or environmental um, impact of a business. So the core sort of aspect of how we do that is we sort of find businesses where we believe there's a clear alignment between the company's business or commercial operations with its social or environmental impact. So the way that we think about measuring and managing impact um, at our portfolio companies, um, and I should add that so I'm an investor at Being Capital Double Impact, and I've been helping um, one of our portfolio companies really navigating this process, which we'll, I will get into. But the core um, way that we sort of manage impact is we sort of believe, you know, we don't want to turn our portfolio companies into reporting agencies. Um, and we want to make sure that um, they're sort of focused on you know, what is important and what sort of drives the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we do is that on a month-to-month -month basis, we sort of focus on um, a core set of KPIs, um, and of which you know, two or three might of, them, of them will be more impact-oriented. Um, and I can give you a more tangible example maybe uh, later in the session. Um, and then what we'll do um, on an annual basis is use the B impact assessment. That sort of um, is a more collective measure of how we run the business um, and sort of more of the ESG aspect of the business um, to sort of supplement that month to month um, sort of management with them. Okay, thanks Judy. Margaret? Hi, I am Margaret Berger Bradley here from Philadelphia and I'm here um, and on this panel wearing two hats. Uh, first, I am uh, with an organization called Ben Franklin Technology Partners. It's a really uh, special breed of organization where we in fact have state funds that over the years we have invested and as, as re we derive returns are the ours to continue to invest in technology companies across our region. Uh, I joined Ben Franklin specifically to build impact into what we were doing where our CEO and others started to look at the portfolio and realize mm -hmm. we had this um, in Kuwait. We had this, we had impact unarticulated. Mm -hmm. Companies that would perfectly fit here at SOCAP who never would speak in this language about themselves and we had opportunities to, to support them differently. Uh, at the same time, I uh, joined this, we were creating something we're calling Impact PHL. So I'm here today as a member of the steering committee of Impact PHL, which has launched uh, Best for PHL, and I encourage you to take a peek at bestforphl.com, uh, where we have used 
the uh, B-Lab tool, there's a mini version of this deep dive uh, an analysis that Judy's having her folks do uh, each year that any company can do, and you can do it in 30 or 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so we're using that across our region. We're using it within our own portfolio, but we're using it across the region to engage all kinds of companies from cafes or electricians to, you know, Janney and larger uh, financial service firms, any, any company, every shape and size, to just get a little taste, to make some uh, choices about how they then, by understanding more how they're doing along the indicators that I know we'll talk about soon, what are the things I want to do better? Mm -hmm. And to use this as their own checkup for themselves. That's great. And so I think that gives you a, a window into how folks are using it. Um, but I, would, I do want to spend some time in cognizant of, a, of doing a deep dive on kind of what is the B Impact Assessment? Where did it come from? Um, what's our intention with the tool? So if we can get the next slide up. Um, so the, the B Impact Assessment is a, is a free and public good. You can go to bimpactassessment.net, and any company can register for the tool. And, and as, as both Judy and Margaret said, the intention of it is to help companies understand and measure and manage their social and environmental impact. And where this sort of came, came from um, was uh, over 10 years ago when the co-founders of B-Lab um, were looking for kind of their next phase in their careers, um, they thought about uh, maybe raising their own fund and investing in companies. And one of the things that they realized during that process is that there was great visibility into good products. You could go and you could see if something was fair trade or if it was organic or, you know, buildings are, are, US, are, are LEED certified. But there was no way to understand what was a good company across an entire company's operations, across their products and services. Um, was a company walking the walk or were they just... Um, you know, were they just kind of hiding behind good marketing? You know, maybe they were putting out a great product, but, but teaching, you know, treating workers maybe not as, as fairly or as thoroughly as they should have. And so uh, they did a very big shift <laughs> instead. Instead of, you know, raising and funding and investing in companies, we're going to create a nonprofit and, and try to create systems that allow for good companies to be identified, to be leaders, to grow, and to scale. And so the B Impact Assessment um, is really at the core of the work that we do, both um, for, for certifying companies, so companies that become certified B Corps, and then a lot of the work that we're doing with investors and with partners across their networks um, to help them manage and measure. Importantly, the B Impact Assessment um, looks at the five stakeholder groups that are impacted by a company that's in operations. So first, thinking about the governance of a company, so things around transparency and ethics and accountability. The second is that it looks at your workers. So what around, um, you know, things are around wages, around professional development, about your management structure. The next is, is your environment and um, thinking about what your environmental management systems are, um, how you're using energy, uh, your community, which is covering um, how you are thinking about engaging with your suppliers, whether you're a small services firm or a, a, a law firm and, and where you're sourcing your kind of office materials from, all the way to if you're a large manufacturer and how you're managing your plants and your operations and your waste streams. And then finally, your customers. So are you providing a product or a service that's serving a customer base that has historically been underserved or, or missed by the market? Um, and how are you helping them meet that need? So those are the five areas that all companies, uh, when they go through the B Impact Assessment, are being assessed on. And importantly, the way that the assessment is, is structured um, is that it is meant to help companies create and go down a road path. A road map is, is how we kind of think about it. So, so thinking about what do we do today that may have an impact on our workers? And if it's really important for us over time to improve that, to retain employees, what are the things that we can put into place that will help us um, do that and do that around best practices that are already in the field? So that's a little bit of, about our, um, you know, kind of the structure of the assessment. Um, one of the things I'll say that has been a huge learning for our organization over time is what does it mean to help companies start this journey? And um, for a long time, uh, when we first started the B Impact Assessment, uh, we actually created it on an Excel sheet, <laughs> which was um, 
uh, a painful process, truthfully, <laughs> for companies to get through. It's not super exciting to fill out uh, cells on an Excel document. Uh, we then moved it to an online platform, which was a very small step up. It, it, it felt sort of static. It was very um, not super interesting to look at, not, not a very engaging and dynamic thing. And, and a lot of the feedback we got from companies and from partners was, you've got to make this easier, and you've got to make it sticky. It, it, it can't feel like taking the SAT, mm -hmm. um, which it did, right? That's, we're like having flashbacks to high school, or at least I was as I was going through it. And that can, that can be challenging. And, and we were a nonprofit, and, and we were not started as a technology company. So for our organization, it's been a huge learning curve, I would say, over the last five years to say, what does that mean? Um, how can we help uh, build a better tool and also make it something that, that is really rooted in best practices that are in the business community? And so um, if folks go on to the beimpactassessment.net website, what you'll see is a totally different, much more engaging platform uh, than we had even 12 months ago. And so if you are uh, maybe coming back to our work for the second or third time, it's possible that if you, when you take a look today, it, it will look and feel hopefully much different. And I should also say, it's, it's continuing to be a learning process for us. So if you go on the tool, and as, as both of you have and as your companies have, continue to give us feedback on that process and what it looks like. Um, we take that seriously and we really use it to um, engage with how we build a better tool. Um, so I'd love to ask you both one more question and then turn it to the audience to see if there are pressing questions that we can we can dig into. And then I've got some other ones um, uh, that, I, that I can go through as well. But, but to start, I'd love to know, before we had an opportunity to partner with your organizations, how were you all thinking about impact? And how were you engaging with your companies around impact? Yeah, sure. Um, so as I said, Double Impact is a new fund, and actually we had uh, decided as a fund to engage in the impact assessment from the beginning. So we're sort of in our first iteration um, of that process right now. Um, with that said, I'd sort of mentioned um, we do sort of a monthly KPI um, dashboard with our um, company. Maybe I'll um, provide a little bit more detail on that um, right now. So the company that I'm working um, with, one of our portfolio companies, is called Impact Fitness. Um, it's a Planet Fitness franchisee in the Midwest, in Michigan, Indiana, where um, obesity and um, high sort of high blood pressure rates um, are sort of the worst um, among the worst in the in the United States. Um, a very mission oriented management team, but um, they sort of don't know what impact investing is, and we sort of had to educate them um, on that process um, all along. And so the way we've um, thought about managing impact again, um, so on a month to month basis, the impact metrics that we track um, are sort of threefold. So one is around access, um, so providing access to people who wouldn't have access to uh, gyms otherwise. Um, and we track that by just new member growth and what percentage of those new members are first time gym users who've never been to a gym before. The second is around health. So once we get these members in the door, how do we make sure that they're sustaining their usage um, and continuing to get the health benefits from attending the gym? So we track usage for that. The third is around community building. And so we sort of track dollars that we're investing into our local communities through construction or through sort of local salaries um, of their employees. So those are sort of the three core metrics that we track on a month to month basis. Um, and as you might imagine, those are all metrics that even a, sort of a completely financial investor would also care about. Um, and so we've been sure to sort of make sure that we're focusing on metrics that are, again, critical to both the impact and the commercial operations and really speak to the sort of alignment piece between the two. Um, and again, we've just done our um, impact assessment. And so it's sort of been a, a learning process um, with our management team, which I can get into detail about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for us, too, I think this tool is allowing us to do things that we didn't even try to do mm -hmm. before. We're really, I said two things that we're doing. We're really using it in three ways. Uh, my role is to infuse impact into the life of Ben Franklin, not just in the companies mm -hmm. that we invest in, but in all ways of what we do. And so we did the full assessment ourselves. Our HR director, our chief administrative officer that went through and tweaked from there, and it gave us a platform for ourselves. And I encourage you to do it for your own organization. Um, to take a look at how we're doing on this. We're not looking to become a B Corp, we're in fact uh, a nonprofit organization, so we can't really be a B Corp, but it gave us some language again to make decisions about when you have to do some things that are easy and some things that are hard. Um, in fact, the two priorities we're taking on, 
energy efficiency of our building is not str strong enough, and our environmental, our recycling programs. We're in an old, we're in a space like this, in fact, in some ways. We're in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and there's a lot to be done to make this space uh, more energy efficient. So it gave language to mm -hmm. talk with the people who are in the roles, whether they are the purchasing people, the financial people, the um, human resource people in our organization. Um, we've always tracked impact. Uh, we report back to the state. So we've been counting jobs and tracking impact in all those ways you might imagine a state uh, might want to hear. But we never had any way of talking to companies about impact in a, in a deeper way. And when we had our uh, call uh, a week or so ago, I was just chuckling to think, you know, our, our investments are on um, average about $200,000 and never more than a million in a company. And so to realize that what we were doing and what Bain was doing were so similar, <laughs> it's like, it's, that's, that's learning too. Mm -hmm. You know, there is some sort of common sense to this of first focusing on the key performance indicators, what matters to the company mm -hmm. before we bring in what we think matters for the world. Mm -hmm. And then overlaying this um, and how we want a company to, to live and breathe. Um, the best four program we're using as a, form of civic engagement. And I don't know what we would have done mm. in a press version. I think there have been lots of efforts to just connect people in doing what might be good mm. for uh, the community. But what's different here, I was it's, it's not just doing what is, first, it's based on a data platform that has tens of thousands of companies like yours. So I'm not telling you to do something that manufacturers of your size, because you're always compared to like companies, don't do. I, you know that there are plenty in this already, because you're seeing yourself. Um, but not only, you know, I'm not telling you to try and do something that, that others don't do, but we also have pretty strong data, and it's part of what we're assessing, that, that this, I tell people, this isn't just, this isn't nice. <laughs> it's smart. Mm -hmm. Millennials care that the companies they work for care about these things. Mm -hmm. Customers care. So if you're not finding it in your heart, like your founders did originally, <laughs> then find it in your pocketbook, mm -hmm. that you're not going to retain the talent and you're not going to retain the customers if you don't pay attention to these things. Yeah. So it gives us that framework that we would not have had without yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I like the way you put it you know, during our call, which was sort of delineating what the company does mm -hmm. from how the company is run. And you know, as investors, it's sort of easy to focus on what the company does um, and sort of forget about all the other things that sort of lay the foundations for what the company does. So. And I think what I um, heard both of you really elevate through your work is that it is um, to, to do this work success, success, successfully, it, you can't just send out a survey, you can't just send out a spreadsheet, you can't just send out a request and say, do this thing and, and, and walk away and come back in a couple of weeks and hope that it's done. But you really created a, a conversation around it. You really said, this is a tool for a broader vision that we have for the work that the companies are doing or that we're doing within our own organization. And I think that's, that's really powerful. And I think, um, you know, from, from my experience and from I think what I've heard a lot of people say at SOCAP this year and at other years is that that data for data's sake or measurement for measurement's sake is a, uh, is a useless exercise, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. how can we create tools and, and create structures and um, that lead to, to better decision making? Um, and having a framework that, that others are using, I think is really valuable. Right. And we have done this um, in workshops all over the region. We just started last January. Uh, but part of what we're finding then is if people take the 30 minutes to do this, the mini version, the mm -hmm. quick impact assessment, um, and then have a conversation with others, it's sticking in a different way mm -hmm. than if they did it in their own corner. So in one session, what struck me most is uh, a startup company that's in our portfolio did the assessment. They said they want to do it now because they want to start right. Figuring if you start right, you don't have to figure out how you incorporate this later. Another um, hotshot high growth tech company uh, said, we're probably a little late on this because we mm -hmm. know we've lost some talent recently for some of the reasons that we see in here in our mm -hmm. scores. And then a longer standing um, Gentech company said, this has always been what I've been about, says the founder of uh, more my age than the other two companies. Um, but I don't know if I've embedded it in my company. Mm -hmm. So when I'm gone, is it still about this? 
So three very, very different motivations, mm -hmm. but the same tool gave them the light bulb. Um, and they could then share this with themselves and the other you know, 15 or so in the room. That's great. So I want to pause and see if there are questions um, maybe the, that folks have in the audience or if there are burning topics that you want us to kind of talk about to share from our experiences or, um, or, or what we know that others have, how they're using this. Um, or if you have a question generally kind of about the tool, I'd love to see what's kind of on top of people's mind as we're getting through this. Great. And there's a microphone that's coming around. Uh, I think we are being recorded or live streamed or um, something exciting. So if you can speak into the mic, that'd be great. And if we, we wouldn't mind introducing yourself sure. for your question. Yeah. Sure. Um, Megan, part of Monitor Institute at Deloitte. Um, so as a small impact focused part of a much bigger company, I'm curious if you guys have been exploring using B-Lab assessment for specific programs or parts of larger companies where it might not be feasible for the entire company to go through the process maybe one day, hopefully, um, but for, for kind of those, those small components within the bigger organization. And increasingly, a lot of companies are coming together to do joint initiatives with other companies, focus on specific issues, um, mm -hmm. and how you're thinking about the evolution of B-Lab to measure the impact of those things. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I'd say the way that we are, um, how that shows up, I think, most concretely right now in our work is we, we are doing some uh, work and exploration around how do we uh, build an assessment for much larger companies, for multinationals or public companies, um, which is not exactly the same thing, but, but I think what will come out of that is um, how we think about business units or specific units or programs within organizations. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of learning and we're kind of in the midst of that. And so I'd say um, yes and, uh, you know, look for that in the future. And the other thing I would say, I think right now, is that there's perhaps an opportunity for folks to go into the assessment and see, okay, some of these questions aren't, aren't going to be relevant for a particular program or a particular area of our work, but there are some metrics here that, that we can... Um, that feel really applicable that will help us think about this particular aspect of our work. Um, I think it, building on the point that, that Margaret made about um, the quick impact assessment, that's one way to do it. Is so when you sign up, you're kind of, uh, we give you what we call our warm up lap. Is, is so you get an opportunity to get a couple of questions from each individual impact area. So that's one way. And then at the end of that process, you get immediate feedback that says, on the questions you've answered, how do you compare uh, to other similar sized companies or organizations? So am, are you above average? Are you below average? Are you right on average? Um, and I think that's a great way to then help you think about, okay, to do those things align with the priorities that I have and do I want to think about focusing on them? Mm -hmm. Anything you would yeah. add to that? I would, I would do it that way. When it asks you what you are, Pretend you are a company. Yeah. So don't say then that you're a 50,000 person company. Indicate that you are whatever your unit is. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, it's like a practice test for yourselves. And you're doing it, it sounds like you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for certification. Mm -hmm. It'll get you what you want and really pretty quickly. Yeah. As I said, it's about 40 minutes where the, f I don't know what you all say the whole assessment takes now. Yeah, it, de it depends on um, <laughs> size. I say four and a half or five hours yeah. the first, um, and that's for the full thing. And that's that's on average. If you're a much bigger company, it can take mm -hmm. longer. And one of the things that is um, I'm really excited about that's coming out quite soon on our new platform is the ability to assign different sections to different units within your organization. So you could go in and say, mm -hmm. okay, within the workers area, this is going to go to our HR team. And so they can log in and just take a look at that piece of it. So um, we're really trying to meet folks in that, that way where they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple more questions I saw over here as well. Yeah. Uh, I think that, yeah, we can work up and down or whoever wants to go first. We'll start with them. Yeah. Hi, I'm Morgan Tucker from Impact mm -hmm. Investing at Catholic Relief Services. We're um, a subscriber, a new subscriber to the B Analytics platform, which aggregates data from companies from the BIA. Um, so I was wondering if I could hear more from Judy on what your portfolio companies are saying about their experience taking the BIA, if it's been able to add values in certain ways, and then maybe both from Judy and Margaret, any challenges that you've heard these mm -hmm. companies who are taking the BIA to big base. Be great to learn from that, because we're just starting to use this tool. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I mean, I would say the biggest challenge we face is really just, again, educating our management team on why we're using this tool and how we want them to use it. Um, so, you know, the assessment is out of 200 points, um, and I think it's easy for 
management teams such as um, ours that are so motivated to say, okay, we're gonna aim for the full 200. And it's really not designed uh, to be that um, sort of actually achievable. And so kind of educating them that actually for your first score, um, there's no bad score um, and that the reason why we're doing this is to sort of raise questions um, that we can discuss. So, um, you know, raising questions around how we think about compensation structure for employees, their benefits package, um, anything like that, that we wouldn't think of otherwise. It's, it's a really nice checklist for us to say, you know, we sort of missed points here. Let's have a discussion and a dialogue about, is this something that we think would make long-term sense for us to engage in? Um, so that's been sort of, um, that and and so as we have a sort of iterative um, processes with our management team, I think they've really grown to understand um, and be aligned with us and why they're using it. And so they've actually found it um, really helpful too, and to um, really put into um, the business backbone the things that they've always done. Things like um, you know they are a relatively small company now, so it's easy for them to sort of understand how satisfied their employees are, but the B um, impact assessment sort of encourages you to take it to the next level and say, let's actually track the percent satisfaction rate, for example. And so kind of really um, ingraining things into the business and so that you know, even the next generation of the management team um, <clears throat> comes in, that sort of, there's the sort of, there's sort of a mission lock there. So there, mm -hmm. we have seen positive reception mm -hmm. from our company. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked about, mentioned B analytics though, because that's a, a great point for us to remind for those of you who are investors or wholesalers of any other sort, uh, business support organizations. You know, what we have access to now, if the company chooses to share it, um, for our best for pro, um, program, and certainly with all the companies in our portfolio that take this, we have, um, Amanda even downplayed what they did. I'm, I met the B Lab folks 15 months ago, if I had met them 18 months ago, I would have had n so little patience <laughs> for what this product was. <laughs> Yet 15 months ago, it's a charming platform. It's even cute, yeah, right? It's it even cute. cute. Um, it's very accessible. <laughs> and the an B analytics sounds again, you know, very wonky. Um, <laughs> but you have these wonderful bubble um, Impact cloud. Impact yeah. clouds. <laughs> but you have the ability to aggregate experiences of lots of different companies. And for those of us who are trying to figure out how do we improve life for the community of companies, it starts to give us enough, you know, our chamber is a partner and they realize it's going to let us know that there's appetite for more programs around uh, employee benefits or mm -hmm. there's appetite for more programs around environmental programs because we get this kind of aggregated data. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions over here. Hi, uh, Phil Northcott at Sea Change Labs. Um, one of the things that in, in most of our large enterprises, you know, it's not really one company that, that delivers the value to the customer. It's a whole, you know, value chain and community of companies that do that. And I'm wondering how you go about dealing with the fact that the enterprise as a whole is lots of companies mm -hmm. and they have different cultures and employee satisfaction, well, frankly, the simplest way to raise that is to outsource the, the part of the job that's miserable um, or, or that, you know, doesn't have a, a great engagement, but that doesn't solve the problem. So I'm, I'm curious what your experience is in penetrating the entire supply chain. I mean, we're addressing that from a greenhouse gas perspective, but you've got a much bigger problem that you're addressing. And I'd like to hear some of your insights as to mm -hmm. how you're addressing that. It's a, it's a great question. And, and we have a couple of actually leaders in our B Corp community who have done just this, where they've said, you know, this is a value that's important to us. We're, mm -hmm. we're using this tool. It's helping us think about this thing. And they've actually started to roll this out with their supply chains directly mm -hmm. to say, take the quick impact assessment if you would like to work with us. Um, or uh, take the full B impact assessment, or we're going to give preferential treatment if you're a B Corp. And so there's um, a lot of leaders in this community who are starting to do just that. The other thing I've seen be really successful, um, Badger is actually a great or, uh, example of this. They're a, an organization based in New England, a company that's um, family owned and operated. They make lip balm, like organic lip balms and um, 
cosmetic products, uh, and, and they bring their suppliers, actually they have a supplier day every year where they bring their suppliers to their company and they say, you know, they do a whole host of things, but they spend time like digging into the assessment together because they say, if we're gonna ask you to do this, one, we have to do this ourselves, mm -hmm. and we wanna be really clear about why we think it's a valuable tool for us. So we're seeing it happen in that way, um, and we're seeing folks, uh, to your point, to say, okay, if, if I have an impact here, how can I then tr you know, share that with folks around that next you know, concentric circle of, of, of influence? Um, to be really specific about how it actually also shows up in the assessment is in the community section of the, of the questions we ask, you know, how are you managing your suppliers? How have you written in your own kind of supply management practices? Um, and then your worker section also um, varies depending on if you have the majority of your employees are hourly or salary. Um, and then if you have a, a host of contractors, that shows up in another section of the assessment as well. And so not a perfect tool. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to stand up here to say, you know, we figured it all out. But it is, I mean, the points that you're raising, ra raising are really uh, key and, and things that we're trying to put a couple of different opportunities toward solutions around. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think... There's a couple right, more questions. Right in front, you had. Oh, oh there she is. Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, I'm kind of having an uh, epiphany here. Um, I'm an evaluator, and I did look at the B assessment tool, and uh, you know, the evaluation professional sort of thinks well, every firm or program or project needs a customized evaluation. So, my epiphany is that by developing the standardized tool, which I've reviewed, uh, kind of like an index, it's, it's kind of brilliant because you've made it uh, able to be marketed to a wide group of people and tested and experimented with, as you say, to start a conversation. And I think that is so important. One of the things we struggle with in evaluation is getting the findings used. Mm. So here's my question. Um, have you thought about taking your show on the road and sort of having a, a subsidiary, which is a facilitated conversation about the B-Lab scoring with any company that would be interested? Um, because I, I hear that that's proving useful, and mm -hmm. I think that's marvelous. I mean, that is what you want to do. You want to change behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great um, it's a great point, and I, pr I appreciate that perspective. I think um, a couple of ways that we're doing that. I mean, I think these sorts of you know uh, having our our partners show up at these uh, kinds of um, events and uh, gatherings and, and have have folks be able to hear directly when people are using it. Like it's great for me to stand up here and say this is a perfect tool you should use it, mm -hmm. but that's not meaningful in the same way that is to say you know here's the things that are good and here's that are bad. Um, to your point about kind of a road show, so Best for PHL is is kind of the second uh, iteration of, uh, of a Best for program or Best for initiative that B-Lab launched in 2015. So we started in New York City. We thought like, let's go big or go home. Um, and said, what does it look like to engage um, in a, in a place-based um, uh, kind of challenge to invite the business community to be part of solving some solutions. And so we, we did a pilot in New York City and we're, we're in, you know, wrapping up kind of the second year of that now. We're in Best for PHL, we have Best for Rhode Island, Best for Colorado. Um, and we're seeing a lot of interest, um, not only in the United States, but Rio Plus Bay has been an uh, has been a uh, initiative that's been going along on for a couple of years in Brazil. And, and we're really seeing that there's an energy because people say impact is happening at the business level, but it's happening at the community level. If we're gonna address these social mm -hmm. environmental issues, it cannot be mm -hmm. one investor, one accelerator program, and one company that's trying to do this by itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Jay Cohen Gilbert, uh, one of the founders of B-Lab, I'm sure you could find a video of his online. There was a TED talk. He spoke to the Net Impact Conference last year, and he was extraordinarily articulate. They were, you celebrated 2,000 B Corps. That's fabulous. But back to the earlier point about what a company is, 2,000 companies, you're not going to get to scale that way. Yeah. But congratulations. Yeah. And I always talk about um, if the B Corps are the Olympic athletes, you would never have a world where you didn't have rec sports. Mm -hmm. uh, youth sports and all the things that build your way to it. And so what the best for platform is and what attracted us, and it's, it's branded as best for PHL then, but this quick impact assessment is accessible to other people in other ways. 
is a way for people just to practice it in a little way. But what attracted me is exactly what you described. How many five-person cafes or professional service firms or you know, a 12-person manufacturer would get data about what they look like relative to others who look like them. And that's all the robust you know, database behind the cute little website. And correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. in the assessment, you can actually sort of double click with each question. Mm -hmm. And if, so that sort of someone is asking like, do other companies actually do this and how do they do it? You can sort of double click and it'll sort of show you, so you can sort of put in context. Um, I see like a company that's sort of much bigger in size or similar to size um, as me is doing something like this. That's really interesting. Let's have a conversation about mm -hmm. it. One more question. Yeah. Hi, <clears throat> Matt Pullen from Jobs for the Future. Um, I'm curious if you have um, stories of how becoming a B Corp and becoming more deeply involved in social impact help improve the business. You know, the kind of stories you would tell when, you know, to a business that's on the edge of, well, you know, I care about social impact. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I have the capacity for yeah. this. Like how it's actually improved bottom line sales or customers, you know, has driven that sort of thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and, and to be clear, I mean, I think, um, to Margaret's point, you know, 2,000, I think we're at 2,300 now B Corps. Um, that's a very small percentage of the larger community. And our expectation is not that every company becomes a B Corp. And I'll be really clear, it's not every company should, right? You, you should do the right thing for your, right, for your company um, because there is a legal component as well. So there's a part about, you know, Im embedding uh, a commitment to your uh, stakeholders into your, the legal framework of your business as a, as a part of it. Um, but there are a number of ways, I mean, where we've seen companies that um, as they've become B Corps are seeing uh, build, build their own relationships on the business side, whether they're uh, B2C or B2B and having being part of that community be a real value add for them. Um, and we've seen a lot of B Corps actually, I've been uh, personally really impressed and excited to see. So to become a B Corp, the first step is you have to score an 80 out of the 200. A lot of companies, right, to get to that point is, um, you know, they do a lot of work and then they go on and keep doing more work even after they've achieved the certification. So um, we've seen folks who have, have said, okay, you know, we're at 81 right now and we want to be at 90 over the next year. Um, and so they've really started to identify some practices or some policies that said, okay, that's, that's important to us. Um, and we didn't realize that this is how we should be actually thinking about living that out. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you all have examples or, or kind of sharing how you've been thinking about this or others that are. You know, your question was most specifically about those that are B Corps mm -hmm. as opposed to those that have taken yeah. these issues into consideration. For those who've taken the issue into consideration, um, most significant is the uh, ability to attract talent. Mm -hmm. That's what's of interest to people more than anything. Yeah. So um, that's where our, our experience has been so far. We have a few companies in our um, startup portfolio that became B Corps, oh. uh, became B Corps uh, right when they were very young. And I think that is helping them and attract certain kinds of capital. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't at all yet say that that's going to be um, a make or break. I mean, there's so many more kind of central questions mm -hmm. for a young company like that. Yeah. I mean, not only attract talent, but also retaining it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the employer mm -hmm. section, again, for our company was really enlightening because they've always thought, and they do really have um, really great practices and a culture, but they haven't really ingrained it to the business yet. And I truly believe with um, that sort of ingrainment that it is actually good for the long-term sustainability of the business. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to the point about attracting talent, um, uh, the, the CEO of, of Data.World, they're a technology um, company, they do their, their data platform, they're, they're B Corp and a public benefit corp. Um, Matt was on a panel yesterday and said, you know, we're in a really competitive marketplace and, and attracting good talent, mm -hmm. the best uh, caliber folks have options. And he said a number of people have chosen to come to their organization, stay at their organization because of that. Um, I, I heard the same thing from an asset wealth manager earlier this week. They said, you know, for particularly for young talent, it's coming out of um, college or out of grad school, being able to say, hey, I, I want to work hard. I want to do um, a specific thing, but I want to do it in a company that's um, serious about their values. That for them is a, speaks a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. um, Todd from Laureate, who was actually supposed to be on our panel and unfortunately uh, got caught, um, 
because of the, of the fires and was not able to make it, uh, was actually moved over to Loria Education uh, because of their B Corp certification status. Mm -hmm. And he would have been a great example of somebody yeah. who could speak about that experience, yeah. I think I saw a couple more hands and yeah. Hi, Megan McFadden. Um, I was hoping you could speak to a little bit um, if the B impact assessment is the first step in the journey, what the second step of the yeah. journey is and, and how you move from getting to 80 to 100%, whether it's intentional infrastructure that you guys are building or whether you've seen it emerge from the grassroots, what you're seeing some of your portfolio companies turn to if they don't have the in-house expertise or capacity to, to make those changes. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, on the certification, um, if you if you want to become a B Corp, the first thing is to take the assessment itself and to, to hit that 80 number. Um, then you go through um, some verification process with it. We have a, a team of about 20 standards analysts who work with companies to verify their responses and, and review documentation. And then there's a, a legal component. So embedding, as I said, uh, the, le the right legal structure based if you're an LLC or a C Corp, et cetera. Um, but your question, I, I think the other part I heard that is like, what do you, what do companies do if they're not where they want to be, whether they want to become a B Corp if they have identified stuff? And, and I'll let you both kind of speak mm -hmm. to that experience and, and how you're seeing companies um, put into practice on this work. Mm -hmm. In what we're doing, again, with the quick impact assessment, we're meeting companies where they are and quite comfortable with that. So they're doing the quick impact assessment and we're asking each company, even when they're there with us in that workshop, to identify one thing that they intend to tackle. Because this could either be overwhelming when you look at the, all the range of things you can do to improve any element of these in your company, or it can be a good you know, starting list. Tackle that one thing. And what's neat about using it in a portfolio, I would think, is that then you can figure out, and then what from there? Um, that's what's interesting to our chamber partners in this too, you can start to figure out, once I do this, what do I want to conquer next? So each path is going to be um, really quite particular to the company itself, because I now got my, you know, my BMI and my blood pressure, my everything else, and I get to decide what's that next step I'm going to do for myself. Yeah. I mean, it could really be someone's full-time job. So I think really setting the right expectations um, with your company is really mm -hmm. important. Um, with Impact Fitness uh, specifically, um, they really made it sort of fun, um, and I really appreciated that um, from them. So they've tasked actually their marketing manager with this, um, and she sort of created this sort of color-coded uh, checklist um, spreadsheet of all of the things that they could do with sort of greens and oranges and reds of how tangible everything is. And they sort of have goals for next year and two years from now, and sort of a calculation of where our score would be if we did all these things. So it's been really great um, getting their um, sort of really positive reception from that. And again, I think we're not expecting them to ever reach 200. And I think it's that's totally fine to say and say, actually, we're not like actually deciding not to do something that is in the assessment, but saying we actually don't think for our company specifically this one um, makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's still important. And so uh, we do want the score to grow, but we're not so um, sort of gung-ho about, you know, reaching the full sort of potential um, score out there. Great. Were, were there any more hands right now or folks have questions? We've got a couple more. Oh, another one here. So uh, one of the things I've seen in quite a number of companies is uh, the use of HR tools like Bamboo HR or you know a variety of these, what I'll call uh, computer-aided HR tools. And I'm wondering if you've taken a look at partnering with a number of those people to build you know, some of these best practices right into the HR IT infrastructure mm -hmm. in a way that makes it really easy to scale. It's a great question. Um, Can you say a little bit more about that? So exactly, um, like an example yeah. of what you might integrate into HR. Uh, well, a, a great example is, uh, you know, usually in your HR database, uh, you've got, you know, all the benefits packages, and you've got the contracts, you've got policies, yeah. you've got <laughs> vacation. You know, it's. Uh, and, and what managers can see and what managers can't see. You can decide on what your values are and you can turn those into code, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. They're just procedures 
and you can tell the computer to do that. And the computer will do it every day, every night, whenever the person <coughs> logs in. You, you know, it, it's much less effort than, than trying to influence person to person. Um, so, you know, you can, you can code things that are incredibly difficult to make change strictly through a human to human pathway. Um, we could talk about yeah, more about how you yeah. do it, mm -hmm. but yeah, and no, it's an interesting question. I, I, I'm, my initial reaction is no, <laughs> that I don't, I don't think we have. But it's a, I, I think your point is um, I, I, well taken. That, that there might be an opportunity, right, for us to, for you know, not just send folks to our platform, but how do we help bring some of those practices out of our platform and share them with others? Um, and it makes me think actually, kind of one additional point about the assessment itself. So, so if you go through the assessment, one of the things that you'll see is that we are not creating the standard of what it means to have good worker practices in that sense. What we are is relying on what, what is existing already as best practices in uh, the business community around um, how do you retain employees. And, and what, what the assessment is, is helping uh, bring to light is how are you putting those things into place? How do you engage that? And so, you know, we're, we are not environmental management experts, so we, we've relied on, on experts in that place. To, great. Um, so, yeah. And That's a neat idea for how do you get like B-Lab quality standard uh, reflected then in what an HR firm might do, what um, a waste management firm may offer any of those areas. All we've done related to that thus far is try to engage those sort of characters as um, access points for reaching companies as we're launching Best for PHL. Uh, we are highlighting some of the best that's available in, um, my colleagues have created these 22 resource guides because part of the question of, of how do you, what do you do once you've done this assessment, you tell people to do something about it and you leave them on their own. We created these assessment guides and you can see them as well really a work in progress at our at bestforphl.com uh, just like if you're trying to start doing this this is what you might look to do so we've turned to some of these folks as experts in the area as wholesalers for reaching other companies and our next hope is that some of those are companies that would want to sponsor this because we've done it this with very very little funding other questions yeah Uh, first, thanks for this presentation. It's been really helpful. Um, my name is Adam, and I'm speaking from an enterprise perspective. And I think my question is really about making sure I understand what that verification process mm -hmm. looks like. So we start off online, we do our assessment, and then we work with some folks from B-Lab. Mm -hmm. I think there's two parts to my question. Is it, in, is it a repeated process that I would do annually? And then also, I imagine there's some auditing element to it, but is there also kind of mentorship that folks from B-Lab would provide where we can kind of learn how to improve, where we don't have best practices yeah. and just have a clear sense of where we find resources to improve. Yeah, great question. So um, to be really clear, you don't have to do any verification process if you just want to use the tool. So any company can log in, create an account, and never have to interact with our team if you don't want to. And you never have to become a B Corp. Um, you never have to enter your credit card number. There's no, you know, it's literally just your email and the name of your company. Um, but if you want to become a B Corp, uh, when you, after you go through the full assessment, um, say you're, you know, at that 80 bar right around, you submit your assessment, you hit submit, and we say, great, we're going to contact you. You will hear from somebody on our team that says, okay, we're going to spend some time looking through your assessment. And while we're looking through it, we'd also need you to provide some documentation that supports the questions that are showing up in the assessment. So if we ask you questions around living wages, um, you know, we want you to provide, here's some documentation that says, here's the number of employees I have in our, our wages in the last fiscal year. Um, usually that level of documentation is kind of six to eight pieces of documentation. If you're a little bit bigger, it looks a little bit different. Or it's a little bit broader. You may have 10 or 12. Um, then once you go through that process, our team reviews your documentation. We then actually get on the phone with a, with a, a senior manager from that team, and we go through the assessment, um, really spending a lot of time digging into the most material questions to understand is the documentation that we're looking at and the way that you've answered the assessment and, and the research that we understand of your company, does it match up, and can we get to a finalized score? 
sometimes companies go through that process, and if you were at an 85 before, you might actually fall above that, below that bar now, or you might actually have gained some points in that process. So we finalize that score, and then you do the, the legal piece of it. And you sign a term sheet, and, and, then, and then there's an annual certification fee. Um, every year, our team also does on-site visits to 10% of our B Corp community. So our team is actually going into the field and, and meeting those businesses, uh, you know, where they are. We're like, as, uh, as I think our, one of our co-founders, Bart, says, is we're like kicking the tires a little bit, you know? So we, we bought this car and we want to make sure that it is, people are doing what they say they're doing. Um, it's not um, an on-site visit like the health department. We don't show up unannounced. Uh, you know we're coming. Um, so I guess if you didn't have solar panels on your building and you told us you did and you wanted to put them up before we got <laughs> there, you could, but you know. Uh, so. So that's the process. Um, and then every two years, uh, companies that are B Corps have to update their assessment. Um, so you won't be selected for an onsite every single year necessarily, um, but uh, we will ask you to go back in, update that assessment. And that's also a recognition that your practices and policies may have changed in the last two years. Um, and so you've got to go through that to update it um, and, and to retain as, as part of the B Corp community. Um, to your question about, well, now that I've done this, like, how, how do I learn? How do I get better? Um, it is, I think, the m one of the most valuable aspects of becoming a certified B Corp. And I'd also say more broadly, being part of um, the broader B Corp community. I mean, that's how I think about, uh, about your organizations and the work that we're doing is that there's a broader B Corp community. Um, we think about it as like a B economy um, where there's an opportunity for folks to learn from one another. So specifically for B Corps, we are having more and more events where we call it build. So they're, they're B leadership development opportunities that um, local communities of B Corps are actually running um, and, and, and organizing um, that reflects the needs of the business leaders in their community. And so there's an opportunity for folks to connect with one another. Every year we have an annual champions retreat where uh, we bring B Corps from around the world together. Any B Corp can come to that. Um, so we, we're doing stuff like that. We've also, with our with our partners, we've been, we've been holding summits um, and, and annual meetings. Uh, and we're also creating online places for partners to come together, share resources and say, hey, you know, I'm doing a reporting thing that looks like this, or this is how I'm communicating my impact, or here's the challenge I'm running into with my companies. They're not super psyched about doing this. <laughs> like, how do I, how do I create incentives, or how do I position this in a different way so that it can be really meaningful to them? And I don't know if you guys have found that valuable if you've gone through this process. And I actually love the idea of um, maybe having like an, a mentor, mm -hmm. like you had mentioned, uh, maybe someone in a similar industry. I don't know if you guys do that already, mm -hmm. or even like having discussion groups, which we had discussed um, either virtual or in person around really industries, because I think. Um, for our company specifically, they are um, trying to find more yeah. um, comparable companies in the fitness industry specifically um, that they can sort of look up to. So I really love that yeah. idea. Um, I'd love to point out, uh, Amanda shared that the first Best Four program was New York, where B-Lab worked very closely with the city of New York, and it was a city-led initiative um, with all that goes with that, meaning the budget and the, the um, politics too. We deliberately structured ours as a civic initiative where Impact PHL, our alliance, led this. But really significant was the support we got from our local B Corps from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you think of it again as the Olympic athletes who are really ready to coach youth sports. They want to engage people in doing this. We've had B Corps that have provided in-kind support, our logo, a lot of project management and strategy work, communications work was all done by B Corps in our region. And part of the model, when we have some more resources to build it out has been uh, a mentor relationship mm -hmm. and how do we use those B Corps. They're, you know, they've made commitments for kind of the level of effort they would put into our region. I'm sure there are B Corps that would work with your, with Impact yeah. Fitness mm -hmm. uh, and I'm certain there's somebody in, in that case it doesn't have to be a ge geographic. Mm -hmm. Industry and scale probably matters more, mm -hmm. um, but they've been really quite forthcoming uh, and supportive. Yeah. And you can, if you, if you want to find B Corps in your area, you can go to bcorporation.net and look at um, the, the B Corp community. We have a, a directory you can search by industry. So if you're looking for somebody in a similar industry um, or location by, by city and state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got five more minutes or so, so we're happy to take more questions. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name's Erin Hughes, and I work for Windrock International, and uh, we're an international nonprofit. We are working right now in Thailand and looking at trafficking prevention um, and reducing slave labor. And so I'm curious about some indicators.
with respect to supply chain with your B Corp, mm -hmm. um, with the, you know, when you're talking to a company, how much detail do you go into the supply chain? Mm -hmm. And also what you're doing in internationally, um, either with Thai companies or Singapore yeah. companies or others? So it's a great question. So um, on the supply chain side, uh, the specific questions in the assessment, um, and this kind of speaks to how our assessment is structured. Um, the assessment, we have over 70 tracks of the assessment itself. So every company is answering questions in those five impact areas. But the track that a company sees is based on their sector size by number of employees and location. Um, and so a company may see a different supply chain question if they're a very large company versus they're a very small company. And if they're an emerging market versus developed markets. And so those kind of questions are going to be tailored to a company based on, on where they're located. Um, to your question about kind of what is the uh, growing movement. So, so I work with B-Lab North America, but we actually have six other global partners. So we are in Latin America, uh, the UK, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on a couple more, but you, you can go to our site. But we also have country partners th that are working and we are um, in the process. I mean, one of the things that we've seen actually is a huge interest um, from, from Asia. And so I think we're seeing this. And, and the way I should, I should be really clear about how we work with global partners is that we respond after that community has, has sorted started to kind of self-form. We're not sending folks from, from uh, our New York office or our Philadelphia office to go and start uh, B-Labs in other countries. Uh, the B-Labs that, uh, that have been created in other, other uh, regions uh, reflect and, and are run by the business leaders in those communities. Um, and so we're uh, happy to touch base uh, offline and share with you kind of who we've got in the region. I don't think we're in Thailand. I think we've got some folks um, in, in other parts and so happy to connect you with them as well. As I, I, I mean, I just want to kind of pose one question or, or kind of give you all both a chance to um, kind of share final thoughts, which is um, as we think about, uh, you know, B-Lab is celebrating its 10, 10 years this year. Um, we ourselves are thinking about what does the next 10 years look like? I know that has been a big theme here at SOCAP this year as well. And so um, we've shared a little bit about what the work we've done today, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on where does this go from here? How do you think that it will um, change the work that you do either with individual companies or more broadly across your organizations or across your communities? And what's your hope for that? Um, and what do you think maybe the challenges that we're going to have to address in order to make that, that vision become reality? Yeah, I mean, I have no answers, just <laughs> more <laughs> questions, really. Um, I mean, I would say the tension um, or the challenge that we're probably going to have to face is, um, you know, obviously, as the impact investing community has grown, we've um, come to try to be more standardized and rigorous with our assessments and our metrics um, across industries, across regions, across size. Um, there's sort of a potential sort of reductionist element in that. So how do we sort of um, reduce or potentially just represent the social or environmental impact, which is so complicated and nuanced of a business um, into a set of metrics? So kind of balancing, um, yes, we want to be rigorous. We want um, metrics that we can stare at and start conversations, but also balancing that with this is a very complicated um, human and environmental impact. Um, and how do we think about sort of customizing um, sort of the impact and, and capturing the sort of more co complicated and nuanced impact of a business, I think will be the challenge for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, for us, uh, the quick impact assessments is best for programs. Purpose is to be an organizing tool. I mean, there was a time in our city, uh, in lots of cities, where there was much more of an expectation that businesses were civic leaders too. Mm. And we've lost too much of that. So we're using this as a tool for engaging businesses of every shape and size in providing the civic leadership where we know that it is um, clearer than ever that government and nonprofits don't alone have the resources to do what we need to do. So any of the ways we continue to infiltrate, infuse is the word I use <laughs> when I'm trying to be more proper, but the way we can infuse some of this thinking into lots of other worlds, mm -hmm. which is why I really applaud B-Lab's movement from just keep finding who the leaders are to figuring out how do we engage lots of um, people is something I think is, uh, continues to be important in creating an easy enough vocabulary mm -hmm. for what this is. Um, selfishly, I would love 
more of a tool from um, B Lab that serve the needs of the startup communities best. Mm -hmm. Because of the scale of investments we do, it's hard to get at, we have, you know, if you had every conference here that talked about what is impact, what is an impact, if we could get something that was as catchy as your tools are now, mm -hmm. that would allow us to engage with young companies, and I think it would be a huge gift to the field. That's great. Well, I want to say thank you both um, for being here today, um, and importantly, thank you for your leadership. And, and uh, you know, we're doing the work, but you all are actually making it happen. And so uh, we appreciate your leadership and, and sharing. Um, and, and to all of you for joining our conversation today, um, I'll stick around for a few minutes if folks want to come up. And I don't, I don't know if these ladies have to run off to yeah, the next you. meeting, but we, we may all be here if you want to come up and ask some specific questions. And thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Thanks.